On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue looks at sharing your testimony. So when do we do this? When do we share our testimony? Any chance we can get, really. There's not any one time or one space where we, where we should or shouldn't. But the mo most important thing to ask yourself, would someone benefit from hearing my story? As Christians, we're called to share our faith with others and to evangelize. For some of us, it's not that easy. We can get tongue-tied. We can not know what to say or fumble through our scriptures and try to figure out how can we explain our relationship with the Lord to someone else. Well, one very useful tool for sharing the gospel is to be able to share your personal testimony. What's a testimony? Well, a testimony is a brief sharing about how God has worked in your life. It's an explanation of a specific way that the Lord has changed your life. Now, this description is a parallel with the gospel. If we speak about the gospel, the basic gospel message of giving your life, giving your heart to Jesus, and how Jesus died on the cross and saved us from our sins and rose again to new life, that's what I would call the objective gospel. It's what Jesus did for us. And that has been written down in the scriptures, and we can share that with someone and lead them to a relationship with the Lord. But our testimony, I would call a subjective gospel. That means it's not of what Jesus did and said 2,000 years ago, but it's how Jesus has worked in my life personally, my subjective experience of that in my own life. Okay? So the basic gospel message and the testimony kind of go hand in hand. It's the big one-two <laughs> to help us evangelize effectively. Now, there are various kinds and lengths and types of testimonies. We might have one about how we developed a deeper prayer life or how we experienced the power of the Holy Spirit or a particular healing in our life. But the one I want to focus in on is a testimony of our conversion to Christ. That's sort of the first one to work on. How did I encounter Jesus and give my life to him? And you can have different lengths. I encourage people to learn how to share a three-minute version of their testimony. It seems uh, really short, but that helps us to crystallize and focus in. But we also want to learn how to do longer versions of our testimony for other situations where we have more time. If we're doing a three-minute testimony, we would spend about one minute talking about what happened in our life that led up to what was our life like before we encountered Jesus. And then we might have one minute on our life as we experienced Jesus. What was that turning point in our life? It might have been one event or it might have been a process. And then we have our life in Christ. What's happened to us? What's different in our life now that, our, that the Lord is working in our hearts? If you have a longer testimony, divide it up about the same way. That way, you are not going to have too much time spent on the before or the during or the after. It's got to be balanced. Now, you might wonder, well, why should I share a testimony? What good will this do? Well, first of all, Jesus sent his disciples out in the world as personal witnesses to his resurrection. When they were sharing the basic gospel message, they were sharing what they saw and what they heard. This is what Jesus did for me. It was their testimony too. The basic gospel message and testimony is almost the same thing for the first apostles. He was sending them out. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you will be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, but throughout Judea and Samaria, and indeed to the ends of the earth from Acts 1, verse 8. That scripture is fulfilled when we bear witness to what Jesus has done in our lives. Another scripture that encourages us to be ready to speak and explain what Christ has done for us is from 1 Peter 3, 15. Reverence Christ in your hearts. Should anyone ask you the reason for this hope of yours, be ever ready to reply but speak gently and respectfully. You see, if we're not ready to reply, if we don't have our answer ready, then we can miss opportunities. 
that the Lord is placing people in our path, that he's giving us opportunities and conversations, and we're just not prepared. It's an act of love for your brothers and your sisters, for your friends, for your family, your co-worker, to prepare and to learn how to share your testimony. The first evangelists, the apostles, used testimony quite a bit. St. Paul, in Acts 22 and Acts 26 and Philippians 3, he shares what he went through, his sufferings for the gospel. And that had a powerful effect on those who listened to him because they realized, wow, Paul really means it. He's actually experienced the power of God. He knows what he's talking about. Now let's look at this. Why is a, a testimony so powerful? What gives it this ability to maybe introduce someone to Jesus? Well, first of all, a testimony is very non-threatening. A testimony, if we maybe picked up a Bible and we put it in someone's face, they might run away. They might be scared of somebody quoting a scripture at them. But if you just say, well, you know, when I was 25, you know, I was going through this in my life, probably they're not going to run away. <laughs> People are interested in what happens in other people's lives. It's a point of contact. It's something that stirs up questions and gets people asking more questions and stirs up a desire in them for God. Pope Paul VI said this, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it's because they are witnesses. See, the modern mindset wants to hear personal experience, not just a bunch of facts or information. So it's non-threatening. Secondly, a testimony is personal. A testimony is evidence that God is alive and working in people's lives today, not just 2,000 years ago, not just in some old dusty book. People will be able to relate to some aspect of your life, and that will be something that's concrete and real for them. They can identify with it. Thirdly, it arouses interest. It gives them something that they can ask questions about which they understand, an experience that you had that maybe they've had too. Fourthly, a testimony speaks for itself. A testimony is something that's tough to argue with. <laughs> People can argue with a the teaching, they can debate over doctrine, but it's hard to argue with someone's personal experience because it happened. <laughs> You're right there in front of them. There's not much of a debate that can happen. They could argue about your interpretation of it, <laughs> but they can't argue about your experience. And finally, a testimony is powerful because God is working right at the moment that you share the testimony. There's a scripture in Revelation 12 that describes how the forces of darkness, confusion, and the enemy himself can be pushed away when we speak the name of Jesus and how he has worked in the world and in our lives. Listen to this. I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have salvation and power come, the reign of our God and the authority of his anointed one. For the accuser of our brothers is cast out, who night and day accused them before our God. They defeated him. How? By the blood of the Lamb, Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection to new life, and by the word of their testimony. When we speak and describe what Jesus has done, God is working at that very moment in power. So when do we do this? When do we share our testimony? Any chance we can get, really. There's not any one time or one space where we, where we should or shouldn't. But the mo most important thing to ask yourself, would someone benefit from hearing my story? Would it help them? The question isn't, would I benefit? <laughs> would it help me? Or do I really have to say something because it's important for me to get this in? No. It's important because the other person needs to hear it. And that's something you have to discern. The Holy Spirit can show you that in the conversation. Is this a good time? Is this a good place? Is the person open to listening? It could be shared in a small group if you're with a group of friends. It could be shared on a retreat where you're with other believers to encourage them and build them up in their faith. It could be in a youth group setting or with your family, almost anywhere. 
And remember, you might just be planting a seed for a later move of God, for a later conversion. God will give growth to that seed if you're just faithful to share what the Lord has done in your life. In Isaiah 55, it says this, Just as from the heavens the rain and snow come down and do not return there till they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return void, but shall do my will, achieving the end for which I sent it. Know and trust that the Lord will work and plant that seed in the heart of the one who's listening to you, because the Word of God is living and active. And the Word of God, as it has affected you in your life, the Word of God made flesh, Jesus, in your life, is powerful. Your testimony has power. Share it. Share it so that the kingdom of God may grow. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on sharing your testimony, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on Sharing Your Testimony. On the next edition of Food for Life, from the Charismatic Center in Houston, Texas, Father Mark Goring. Are you finding it difficult? Is the fire missing? Maybe in your marriage. Maybe you feel like I felt as a seminarian, there's no hope. This is going to be a miserable existence. I just need to accept, I need to be faithful and accept my miserable ex existence. We have a very special guest today, Deacon Rudy Ovjack, and he also happens to be my husband. And I have known Rudy for, gee, going on 30 years now, so that makes me feel a little old. But for many years, I've known and appreciated him. Many years we met, and I remember we were acquaintances, and I hadn't seen him for a little while. And when I did see him again, I didn't speak to him all that much, but I noticed that there was something very different about him. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Well, around that time, my late mother said to me, you need to get serious about your faith. You've drifted a little. I'd like you to come back to church and do a Life in the Spirit seminar at our local Catholic parish. So I agreed readily and went back, and there I found Rudy again, ran into him again. And indeed, something had changed. He had had a wonderful conversion experience that would impact him for the rest of his life. And to this day, he is still touched by the Lord in a very special way. So he's here to share a bit of his conversion story with you, and I'm trusting you'll be blessed by it. From time to time as a deacon, I've had the wonderful privilege of speaking to students as they prepare for the sacrament of confirmation. I always find it easy to begin by telling the story of Samuel, who was a very important figure in the Old Testament. And I find in the story of Samuel a great resonance, resonance with my story, and perhaps um, a resonance with the story of some Catholics as well. So here was Samuel. He grew up in the temple of the Lord from the time he was a toddler. So he would have been surrounded by the things of God. He would have heard the scriptures being proclaimed. He would have seen the sacrifice in the temple, the priests wearing their vestments, the beautifully adorned temple. And yet the scripture says something very, quite unusual. It says that Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord been revealed to him. And in many ways, that was my experience. I was born into a beautiful Catholic family. We attended Mass faithfully. I received the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, and Holy Communion. I was an altar server, went through the Catholic school system. But I would say that I was like Samuel. I did not yet know the Lord, and nor had the Lord's word been opened to me. I had a wonderful foundation 
And I know, I suppose I knew about God, hearing the scriptures being read at mass, the gospel stories proclaimed, but I had not encountered the Lord in a way that transformed my life. When I share this story with the young people, I remind them that God is faithful to call us, each of us, just as he called Samuel. So the story continues. We find Samuel sleeping in the temple and the Lord called him by name, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel woke up, but he didn't recognize that it was the Lord's voice, that it was the Lord calling him. And so Samuel went to Eli, the high priest, and asked him, what do you want? Eli said, I didn't call you, go back to bed. And the same pattern, the same um, pattern of the Lord calling Samuel, Samuel waking up, going to Eli, Eli sending him back to bed, happened on a number of occasions. And then Eli, it dawned on him that the Lord was calling the young man. And so the Lord, the Eli gave Samuel some great counsel. He said, when the Lord calls you, respond, respond. I suppose the specific words that Eli instructed Samuel to use, which was speak, Lord, your servant is listening. I suppose it isn't as important as that heartfelt response to the Lord. Mary, for example, used different words. She said to the angel, let it be done unto me according to your word. And her response, like Samuel's, was pleasing to the Lord. It was their yes to the Lord, the opening up of their interior life to God. And through that yes, through their response, through his response, Samuel became a great prophet in Israel. And in many ways, I too was asleep like Samuel. Not a physical sleep, but a spiritual one. I was asleep to the things of God, to the life of God. But God, too, was faithful to call me on repeated occasions, just like Samuel. I remember on one particular evening, I went to Mass on the Feast of St. Stephen on my own initiative and by myself, and I was probably about 21, 22 years of age at the time. And I went to Mass, a parish that I had been to for a number of years. And on this particular Mass, I sensed what I now know was the Lord's presence. It was a beautiful experience. But I had no idea what it was. I just knew something beautiful had happened. And so for a period of time, I went back to Mass daily, hoping to recapture what God had done. And that wasn't meant to be. I suppose I needed Eli's counsel. When the Lord calls, respond. So I share that with the young people, that oftentimes the Lord calls us and we simply don't recognize that it is the Lord who is calling us, each of us individually. It is a personal and intimate call of God to the individual, to the soul of each individual. Now, God may do this when we're alone in our own prayer time or in the reading of scripture or in a corporate setting like mass, hearing a homily. His call is specific and unique to the individual. And I knew for this group of students that there was a group of young people, the National Evangelization Team, NET for short, a group of Catholic young people who travel throughout the country providing retreats to Catholic school students preparing them to receive the sacraments. And I knew that for this group of students that they had come and given them a retreat. And so I asked this group of students, and there was probably about 40 uh, students in the class. And I did a little bit of a survey. I asked them three questions. And I asked them to bow their heads, close their eyes. And the first question that I asked them is how many of you have sensed, have sensed God's love for you, have experienced the presence of the Lord. And about two hands raised up out of 40. I then asked a second question. I said, who would like to experience God's presence? And just about every hand was raised. It was beautiful. 
Then I asked them the third question. How many of you, your hearts were moved at this retreat? And just about every hand was raised. I said to them, that was the Lord calling you. You just didn't recognize it, just like Samuel. But what I left them with is Eli's counsel. When the Lord calls you, whether it is in, through a homily, through a retreat, through creation, respond. Respond with all your heart. And so it was several months after that experience, my experience of the Lord's presence at Mass on the Feast of St. Stephen, that I was invited to a prayer meeting at St. Paul's Basilica in downtown Toronto. And there, Father Bob McDougall was preaching, the founder of Food for Life. He spoke about Jesus in a way like he knew him. He really knew him. He spoke the, of the, the same Jesus who had walked the shores of the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, inviting men and women, young and old, to come and follow him. He said, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This same Jesus, he said, still invites men and women, young and old, to come and follow him. And so he provided an opportunity for us to respond to Christ's invitation. And so I said my yes to the Lord, my fiat. I said, Jesus, if you are who you say you are, then I want to follow you. And then, though there was no parting of the heavens, no voice from on high, as I began to make room for God in my life, by setting aside daily time for prayer, reading of scripture, I began to sense the Lord's nearness, his presence. I had encountered the Lord, and he had changed my life. Prior to that evening, God had somehow seemed aloof, distant from his creation and from me. But now I had experienced the nearness of God, his nearness, his imminence. I began to read the scriptures prior to that evening. I said to myself, I will, should at least read the scriptures once through as a Catholic before I die. And I started in Genesis chapter 1, and by Genesis chapter 3, I closed the Bible. It didn't make sense to me. But after that evening, it was as if God was speaking to me through the scriptures. Just like for Samuel, the word of God had been opened to me. And so, I would say to the one that if you have been moved by the story of Samuel, if you have um, sensed God's gracious activity in my life, then I would invite you to come and follow him. Say yes to him. Say, yes, Lord, I choose to follow you. All that I am, all that I have, all that I'll ever be, I offer to you. And then I would encourage that one to begin to make room in their life for God by setting aside a portion of each day for prayer and for the reading of his holy word. We always give thanks to you who so regularly support us in your prayers and your financial gifts. Without you, the ministry simply could not continue. God works through you to make the ministry continue so that people can have the hope that the gospel brings to each one who hears it. I want to read a couple of short letters to you today just to let you know that this investment that you've made in Food for Life really does touch the hearts and lives of others. One gentleman writes and says, We continue to enjoy the Food for Life ministry. It's our hope and prayer that more people will become regular listeners of your program. Our prayer is that they'll open their minds and hearts and listen to God's word and be more willing to follow the path of the Holy Spirit. Another couple writes to us from Quebec and says, Thank you so much for your program. It's always a source of spiritual guidance which meets the needs of our souls. We love each and every one of you and we hope you'll continue to be present to us for many more years with your obviously Holy Spirit-led teachings. And I thank these viewers for taking the time to write 
And again, I thank you for your faithful support. If Food for Life has helped you in some way, we do need to hear from you. Certainly, these are challenging economic times, and we are sensitive to that. If you are able to help with a one-time gift, if you're able to support us on a monthly basis, we would be most grateful. We want to continue to just share the message of hope that we have in Christ. Please write to us today. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry. You know, we're so blessed to be part of a a democratic nation where we can vote. And when we vote, uh, hopefully our vote reflects uh, what's important to us, what reflects our values for ourself and, and for others. Well, in economic or even in marketing circles, we talk about casting an economic vote. When you cast your economic vote, you're expressing what's important to you. So what do you mean cast an economic vote? Well, it's just an expression for how I spend my money. That when I spend my money, that's a reflection of what's important to me. So presumably that means, you know, your family and, and stuff for yourself and potentially other things too. That you cast an economic vote to reflect your values. And so today, if, if you feel that you've been blessed by the Food for Life ministry, or if you feel that there are other people that are being blessed by it, maybe particularly people you have a burden for, then we would, we would invite you to prayerfully consider writing to us at Food for Life and, and supporting us in some way. We, we of course, know that the ministry is, is also sustained spiritually by your prayers. And so that, you know, that is huge also. So we're inviting anyone today, potentially folks who maybe haven't had the opportunity to, uh, to support the Food for Life ministry, to prayerfully consider that and uh, as God leads maybe um, send, us a, send us a note and, uh, and we'd really appreciate that and we, and we pray for you and, and all of your needs. God bless. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1428 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on Sharing Your Testimony. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. If every viewer gave a loony or a toony each week, all expenses would be met. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life. And our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website at www.foodforlifetvministry.org and follow the link. Thanks to your faithful prayers and tax-deductible financial support, Food for Life is the longest-running Catholic television program in Canada. On the next edition of Food for Life, from the Charismatic Center in Houston, Texas, Father Mark Goring. Are you finding it difficult? Is the fire missing? Maybe in your marriage. Maybe you feel like I felt as a seminarian, there's no hope. This is going to be a miserable existence. I just need to accept, I need to be faithful and accept my miserable ex existence. For an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on sharing your testimony, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on sharing your testimony.